All right, good morning. Happy Easter, and for all of you who I have not seen, Merry Christmas. <laughs> yeah, it's true. It's true. Uh, so, uh, but really, I meant to say Happy Easter, Happy Passover. Um, you know, uh, this idea of resurrection. Uh, <laughs> I started to say that resurrection occurs when our mind is purified by thoughts of love. When we make that shift inside of us that we are willing to think loving thoughts where we have been thinking something less than loving thoughts. Um, I said to someone recently, I think in a class, I said something about, well, when you close your eyes, just focus on the light. And they said, well, what's the light? I don't understand. And I said, anything that is not the dark is the light, right? So if anything not the dark is the light, and that's what, of course, what we are in pursuit of. So, you know, the miracle of Easter, it seems to me, is that in some way, fear that is within us gets dissolved. Um, it's, so what, what comes forward when fear is dissolved is this infinite, immortal, eternal love that is within each and every one of us, and that's the truth about us that we say is the presence, is the spirit of God. So the principle of resurrection is not just for Easter. I mean, this is a principle that applies to us, to our life, to our circumstances every day of the year, really for every situation. You know, Jesus, I think, teaches us that the effects of crucifixion are actually nullified, they're completely eradicated when we put enough love into a situation. Now, of course, I realize we don't always want to do that. You know, where we feel like we're having crucifixion in our life, you know, we want the resurrection. I just don't want to have any process in between. You know, I mean, I want crucifixion. Okay, this is crucifixion, and everybody knows what I'm talking about with crucifixion, right? You know, I mean, yes, Jesus was crucified on a cross, but it's different for us today in 2018. You know, we experience crucifixion, as I said on Friday night. I mean, have you dated? You know about crucifixion. Have you applied for a job? You know about crucifixion. Have you ever had to move? You know about crucifixion. Have you had a fight with somebody in your family and didn't talk for a long? You know about crucifixion. Crucifixion is not something that's way far from us. I think it becomes part of our life. And it's not even so much what other people say or do to us. It's what we say and do to ourselves again and again and again. You know, it's always interesting to me how God, we teach, does not hold anything against us. And yet we hold something against ourselves all the time. We are so willing to say, well, you know, I did really bad there. That was really my fault. I really goofed this one up. You know, the Last Supper was really a Passover Seder. Uh, and the Israelites were, again, an enslaved people, enslaved by the Pharaoh. And so I think that we, um, we have the capacity to be changed by the story the story of Passover, the story of Easter, when we allow the story to really penetrate us at, at the deepest level of our being. Because I think there's something deep down that resonates with the story that says, yep, this is my story. This is the story of my spiritual evolution. This is the story of my trajectory of coming home to God. Because I think there is a message from God for us in, in the story. You know, the Pharaoh who... Uh, enslaves all of us, not just the Hebrew people, uh, the Pharaoh is what enslaves us. So you think about that today. What's enslaving you? What seems to hold you back today in any way, shape, or form, person, event? We could say that's the Pharaoh. The Pharaoh was told by an astrologer that he would be overthrown. You know? And so by a child that was born during this particular time period. So he had every child uh, that was born during this time uh, destroyed. Right? Now Moses happened to be born on the exact day that the astrologer predicted, and Moses' mother, uh, for fear of his life, uh, puts him in a little basket uh, that's covered with pitch so it's waterproof, and she sets him in the bulrushes on the edge of the Nile. And who should find him but the Pharaoh's daughter, who takes him home and says, oh, Daddy, can I keep him? You know, he's so cute, can I keep him? You know, and of course the Pharaoh, okay, honey, since you really want him, all right, you can have him. And of course the woman who she gets to be the nurse is actually Moses' mother. Hmm? So, you know, Moses was raised in a palace. It's kind of like the story of the Buddha. The Buddha was raised in a palace, but didn't have to, you know, being in a palace 
if you think about it, they didn't have to really be that close in touch with the suffering of their people. The Buddha didn't really know what was going on in his kingdom, and Moses didn't really, really know what was going on with the Hebrew people. I mean, he knew it wasn't good for them, you know? But he didn't have to, they didn't have to really relate to their suffering. But ultimately, they did, which is the important thing, I think. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, if we speed up the Moses story, Moses, you know, he grows up, he sees the burning bush, the bush says, go to Pharaoh, tell Pharaoh to let my people go. Oh, boy. Mm -hmm. I want you to save my people. And Moses was like, who, me? Are you talking to me? Huh? And I feel that way so often when, when we receive a little bit of divine guidance, when the spirit of God within reveals to us maybe a next step or that we're supposed to do something, call someone, be somewhere, we think, Oh, no, you don't really mean me, do you? You mean someone else. Clearly, you are thinking of somebody other than me. And I think that like Moses, we're all called on to be more. More of our best self, more of our true self, more of our divine self. We're all called on to be more. And this is actually a part of how our world, our planet, our species continues to evolve by people saying yes to that more that exists within them. So like Moses, you know, we say, who me? You must have me mixed up with somebody else. I think we all have reasons why not us, right? We all have reasons why it shouldn't be us, right? Why it should be someone else. <clears throat> but the other side of that coin is, why not us? Why not us? Who, do, who else do you think is going to show up that's going to make things better? Who else is going to be the light in your family? Who else is going to be the light where you work? Who else is going to be the light out on the road when we're driving or the Vons when we're shopping? If not us, who's it going to be? Right? So we do it or, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't get done. There's um, part of the story of Moses that's always been interesting to me is that God was going to give Moses a staff. And so Moses reached down and picked up a snake by the end of his tail, and the snake turned into a staff. And the staff really um, was a symbol of Moses' power. It, it was his, you know, and we could say that that staff was a representation of his word of conviction. You know, just like we teach in the science of mind that our words have power. What you say about yourself, what you say about life, what you say about other people tends to come true, especially the more feeling you say it with, especially the more you repeat it, you know, especially the more you try to convince your friends of how wronged you were or whatever that may be. <laughs> our words, like Moses, have conviction. You know, when they have conviction, they really, really, really have some power. So... Again, I come back to this idea that for us to have resurrection in our life, resurrection from circumstances, that could be the healing of a relationship, it could be uh, resurrection from being in a job we hate to a job we enjoy a lot more, resurrection from being up to our eyes in debt to having our debt paid off, whatever that is for us, I think resurrection is always, always, always predicated on the energy of love. You know, that the spirit of God in us, in each of us, has existed before we got here, and it continues to exist. And I think this is part of the message of Easter, that when Jesus reappeared to his disciples after the crucifixion, after being in the tomb, when he reappears, he's showing them that there is a part of each of us that is more than physical. There's a part of us that is spiritual, it's eternal, it's ongoing. It existed before we got here, and it will continue to exist. And I believe that this is a big part of what Jesus has come to teach the disciples, to teach people, is that who you are is more than this physical body. You know, and, and if we only identify with our physical body, then we're doing ourselves a huge disservice because spiritually... The bigger part of you is this consciousness, is the spirit, is the soul that you are, and that soul has existed for eons and will continue to exist. Because, you know, and, and all of science points to this now, that matter changes form, but it never ceases to exist. So if that's true about the physical stuff around us, it's certainly true about you. You and your you-ness <laughs> continue to exist in some form. You could not end. Now, 
Yes, certainly the suit of clothes that we're wearing, that will wear out, I understand. And that is a disappointment. That is a disappointment, except for those who like to shop. Uh, in, in which case, look at it as an opportunity to wear something new. Yeah, there you go. All right, so I think, uh, but there's, there's, always, there's always rebirth. There's, there's always new life. Hmm? Um, but we, you know, we were endowed with free will. We were endowed with choice when we got here. Right? And so we get to decide what the priorities are for us. That's, that's our use of free will. That is our use of choice. Hmm? Uh, I, uh, <laughs> I've been very um, affected by some writings by Rudolf Steiner. Now, Rudolf Steiner said that the Christ had existed always, always in some form. But what happened at Golgotha when Jesus was crucified, Steiner says that when Jesus' blood hit the earth, what happened in that moment was that God's love could enter humanity in a greater, fuller way than it ever had before. So it wasn't that humanity was not loved by God. It's not that God's love wasn't present. It was, but now God's love was able to enter in a greater, fuller way. So God's love penetrates humanity in this greater way, and people could experience the love of God here and now because, you know, we have to remember, it wasn't until the advent of new thought, right, which really started with Mary Baker Eddy and Christian science, it wasn't until the advent of new thought that people really got that they could have a heavenly experience here on earth. That up until Mary Baker Eddy's work, Historically, people pretty much felt you had to die to get to heaven. Things only got better when you died. Because think about it, life was really hard for most people. It was really, really hard. Think about how hard it was for your grandparents or your great-grandparents, how difficult their life was compared to us. My grandparents didn't have a microwave. My, I mean, my grandfather was a farmer. If he didn't grow it and kill it, they didn't eat it. And I think, oh my God, no, 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 no. I'd be a, I, I, I would be so, I don't know, a lettuce-tarian if that was me. <laughs> you know, I mean, I, I just don't think I could do that every day. I'm not wired for that. Like I say, I was built for comfort, not speed. You know, I just, if you want speed, you gotta go to the track for that, you know? So this idea, this idea that now, what, what happened with Jesus at Golgotha then going into the tomb and resurrecting, that God's love was more available to us in a greater way than had ever been so before on the face of earth. And what that meant is that people could have healing now. You didn't have to wait to die to have peace in your life. You didn't have to wait to die to have uh, good health. You didn't have to wait to die to have money. You know, all those things that say, well, because people's general thinking was, well, Life is hell, but when you die, it's going to get better. Not really as comforting as one would think, is it? You know? Oh, boy. Well, yes, it, it's really tough now, but when I die, it's all going to be hunky-dory. Yep. Oh, boy. Right, so, so this was the big change that happened in the evolution of consciousness for us. Now, the name Jesus means something more uh, than a historical person. You know, it's the name of a living spiritual principle, which if you resonate with it, then that's great. Then it can do that much more for you. And if you don't, that's okay. You can still practice the science of mind, you know. But the principle that Jesus revealed was the personification of the presence of God, you know. That Jesus was an individual who embodied the universal presence of God as Christ. And Christ is the presence of God that became the person named Jesus. Right? So his nature is a possibility for every human being. So this is what I like about the science of mind, that the science of mind teaches us that what was potential in Jesus, what was potential in Muhammad, what was potential in Buddha, what was potential in Moses, that exists as potential within us. That these are seeds, like seeds of truth, that can be grown and cultivated in us. That they are showing us. They're like um, a step or two ahead of us on the path, and they're showing us that what they have become, what they have achieved, is possible within us. And we don't have to die for it to get better. Isn't that wonderful news? 
oh my God, I just love that, that it can get better now. Well, we say, well, well better now, why, why isn't it better? Well, like Moses, our staff has to be the conviction that we speak our word with. You know, that when we speak our word, something happens. We believe that heaven and earth move when we speak our word. And so this Easter, I would encourage you to think about what is that word that you're speaking? Because, you know, heaven and earth, I believe, are moving. Are they moving in a direction that's working for you? Are they moving in a direction that's good for you? Is it, is it going to benefit you, or are you taking yourself down the drain? Again, I believe that the more we can replace fear with love, the more we have resurrection in our life. And boy, isn't it time for us to have resurrection. Let's pray. So we turn our attention inward now for a moment to just recognize that right here, the fullness, the allness of God, God's infinite loving spirit is right here. And this spirit that was modeled beautifully in Jesus, in Moses, in Buddha, in Krishna, in Muhammad, in all the great beings, I know this same presence of God was there. And that this presence exists in each and every one of us. And we open our hearts and minds to it. And so I speak the word for us today that there is raising up, that there is great healing available for each and every one of us. I know that we are blessed by being together in consciousness. And we think of those we love, our family members and friends. We see them in our mind's eye. And we wrap our spiritual arms around them, knowing that right where they are, God is in its fullness. We let our prayer be a blessing in the world. So all of the things that are pulling at our attention, we say God's perfect activity is right there, as peace, as healing, as reconciliation, as all needs met. We bless our church. We bless all churches. We bless synagogues and temples and mosques and ashrams, all paths to God. And I know that we are blessed by being together, that we all get to be healed. We all get to be raised up. And so with a full heart, I give thanks that this is so. I release this word, and so it is. Together we all say, Amen.